Hello and welcome What The Finances to another episode of the What The Finance podcast, where we talk to experts to help gain a greater understanding about what is happening in the world of finance, investing and markets. On today's podcast, I'm happy to welcome Dave Collum uh, back for a second time. I didn't, obviously didn't scare you away the first time, but uh, he's the professor of organic chemistry uh, and leading thinker on markets and the larger world around us. So Dave, thanks for joining the podcast today. Yeah, well, at least you've broken that expert theme. That's good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No sense in staying in that rut the whole way. Um, yeah, people get angry at us. <laughs> it happens sometimes. It's like, oh, this guy's no expert or this or that. It's like, oh, who cares? Well, you know, I read I read comments like uh, like watching game films. So everyone always says, oh, don't read the comments. But there's information in there. And mm. um, sometimes the the trolling is surreal. Like when one one podcast I did, they they took a I took a guess in the middle of the podcast. I said something about inflation being bad and people don't have 400 bucks to put together to replace their microwave. And I said, which is probably about the cost of a microwave. At least five people said, no, this guy's full of crap. Microwaves don't cost 400 bucks. I'm going, really? Yeah. That's what you're going to have? One guy said, I stopped listening when he said microwaves cost 400 bucks. And I, I'm going, holy cow, you have a very, very thin protective shield. <laughs> yeah, life's too short to worry about that stuff, I think. But uh, Yeah, still funny. Yeah, exactly. But I'm the same. Yeah, I think you have to be brutal with criticism. Like there's some things that are useful, but then you just have to go through it. And if it's useful, use it. If it's not, just sort of discard it. That's sort of what I do. Right, right. But you yeah. should read it. Yeah, I agree. So, Joe uh, Rogan and there's 10,000. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's impossible to, to read through that. So uh, we were talking before and you you know, you've recently released a uh, your famous year in review, uh, which is a fascinating read and it covered so many different topics. I think, you know, from, from some nights I was investing, you know, the economy, the collapse of FTX, Ukraine war, Roe versus Wade, all the controversial topics, obviously. Um, so I guess from your perspective, how was your year? <laughs> oh, my year was fine. Um, well, you know, there's little idiosyncrasies along the way. My wife broke her neck, um, which which right right in the middle of of writing it, and I'm going, oh man, that was inconsiderate. Um, and and so I was sort of bouncing around trying to finish it up. Um, that's actually her second broken neck. She broke it about 15 years ago, and then really surreal. About uh, 20 years ago, my mother slipped it, had her broke her neck, and died. So, so, so they should be investigating me. Um, there's something going on here. Um, I'm unaware of doing it, but, uh, so my year went okay. I had a slightly positive year in, in, in returns and, and that, that, that beats most people. So that's good. Um, and I, I'm predicting an epic bear market. So I hope to be beating, beating the crowd in, in, in days to come. Yeah, it's interesting because I um one of the quotes in I think it was at the start of your investing section was from uh, Jesse Livermore, and it's famous. Everyone's probably heard it. It's uh, there's times to go long, there's times to go short, and there's times to go fishing. So, are you planning on going fishing this year, or I guess what's your plan? Well, you I don't short anymore. Um, I successfully shorted twice. One was from '99 till about 2002. Not a big position. It wasn't going to break me. And it was in a fund that was that was a fund that specialized in shorts. So the fund would go to zero, would not cause me to go to infinity, right? So that was safe. Prudent Bear Fund by Doug Nolan. And then I used the same fund in I think around 05 and exited that in 09. So that was well time. But uh, if I'm shorting, uh, I'm probably making a big mistake. I'm, it's just not in my DNA. I actually tried to short the bond market. And I had Gerard Minnick, who died this year, and uh, Mark, um, oh, Jesus, I'm Mark Gilbert. I've known Mark for 20 years. Um, a Bloomberg say, be careful. And I tried it and I got clobbered. And I said, again, it was a Ridex fund and the erosional costs are ridiculous. So I just, for me, when it's time to not go long, it's time to go fishing. I just go straight to the, the water hole. <coughs> yeah. And you, you know, you mentioned before, you think we're going to see the sort of the mother of all recessions. So I guess why do you think? Well, you say recession, I say bear market. Bear market so sorry. I think the bear market could grotesquely exceed the recession. I don't think this, I'm a believer that the age of V bounces may be over. 
this this idea that you go up and up and then you do this quick jabby downswing and then you go up and up and then you do this quick jabby downswing. Every one of those reinforces in the investor's eyes that um, that if you just hang on, you'll be fine. And I think we're going to do uh, the best approximation would be the Nikkei. I think it's going to grind people to dust and it's going to take decades potentially. Yeah, interesting. And that was, if I remember correctly, I don't know if it's the end of the 50s or the 60s, that was quite some as well between 60s and 70s. Well, in the US. so there's a number. See, investors don't know this. I don't know why they don't know this because, well, because the people who would tell them are trying to sell them stocks. Um, if you held the market in 1906, for example, or in 1929, those are peaks. Um, there was a date many, many years later, which the price on an inflation adjusted basis was identical. That date was 1981. So somewhere between 45 and 75 years, you treaded water. Now there were times where you were ahead, but you returned to that price for the last time. And I'm hoping it was the last time. I would hate to find out if we got there again, because that really would be carnage, uh, 1981. Um, over the last 40 years, which I consider to be one continuous secular bull market, 1981 to the present or to 2021, how's that? Um, <laughs> I, I uh, 3% annualized of that return was, was valuation expansion. And the question is, can you replicate that? And the answer is no. Could you do negative 3% over 40 years? I think you could. So if instead of having a 3% annualized tailwind, you have a th three, negative 3% 3 annualized headwind, that's a 6% annualized swing. It has it's nothing about growth and productivity and you name it. It's all about valuation. That's a scary problem. So if we go back to a, a phenomenal low in valuation because of, say, inflation, uh, investors will be hurt in ways they can't fathom. So the recency bias, by the way, is, is phenomenal. People think recency bias is what happened over the last five years. No, for me, recency bias is what happened over the last 40 I got into a discussion with Gene Epstein of Barron's and, and he seemed to be suffering from that recency bias. And he started quoting Jeremy Siegel in our little debate on Twitter. And, and I went back and quoted a guy named Ed McQuarrie who, who said that if you really look at long time scales, um, bonds and stocks return about the same. And if you go back to Buffett's 99 article in Fortune, I think it was, he said, when you add up everything, and he wasn't talking about valuation, he was just talking about what you can expect long-term returns. He said, after all the fees and everything are out of the way, and he didn't include taxes, uh, he said, you can't get more than about 4%. The market can't, 4%. And that's almost all over the 20th century, um, dividends. And then, my, one of my favorite charts is by a guy named Ron Grice, Greece. I, 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 I've never talked to him, so I don't know how to check how to pronounce it. Um, he plotted the 20th century S&P versus the M2 money supply. Now, we all know the CPI is garbage, right? But the M2 money supply is a pretty clean number, at least until about three years ago, and they stopped reporting it for some inconvenient reason. But the M2 money supply seems like as good an inflation metric as anything, right? How fast is the money growing? And it turns out if you plot the S&P over the 20th century, corrected for the M2 money supply, it's flat. I'm talking flat, not just slightly growing upwards. And so therefore you got all of your returns off of dividends, which in the first half of the 20th century were up four, four, four and a half percent. And then the second half are more like 2%. Now they've gotten to about 2%. You go, well, that's a problem. You go, yeah, well, that's the evidence the market's 2X overvalued. The market cut in half, those dividends would be 4%, provided no damage was done cutting the market in half. So I, this, I'm, I'm trying to destroy your souls. Anyone listening to this, I'm attempting to destroy your soul. Yeah, 20 year bear market. That's crazy to think. So yeah, the, you think it will go the same as, as Japan. So I guess from your perspective, I think well, it could, yeah, I think it could. could. I, I, it's my base. You know, they always say our base scenario, our base case. And that's my base case. My base case, there's so much fuel in the system that has to be burned off that whether it takes, and one year I created a plot showing this, whether it's a straight down drop, 50% straight across treading water, 
which takes, I think, 25 years, assuming GDP keeps growing normally. And, uh, and if you want to grow the markets below GDP and let the GDP slowly catch the markets, uh, you get about a 17% total return, total return over 50 years. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah, everyone's worried now. So do you think we'll see inflation as well? Or do you think we'll go Japanese way of deflation? Or you, I don't know if you have a base case for that. I, you know, I kind of like the model that, um, who the heck was that? Uh, not Lacey Hunt, not Russell Napier, Felix Zuloff, who I've had a few chats with digitally. Um had a rolling inflation deflation model where we would go through various periods of inflation and deflation. And, and it, it sounded like he was pretty tame. Felix is very bare sometimes. And, and, but then at the very end, he says, it's going to be awful. And I go, okay. So you got to the bottom line. So the bears out there, there's very few serious bears who are, who have lightened up and the deflationists seem to have gone inflationist. But uh, one of them got mad at me for suggesting he was still a deflationist. And I didn't really suggest he was a deflation. I just said that the Fed put them in their place. And he said, no, I was right about inflation. He wanted me to correct my write-up. And so I actually did, but it was a trivial correction. But he, he took offense because he, he, had, he had switched to inflation. And he thought I was not giving him credit for it. I got, no, I just... I, what he failed to notice is I put him with two other phenomenally important deflationists. I said, I, I put you in the big leagues, dude. Stop whining. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. So bear market, not sure, look, potentially that Zuloff. Uh, and, and I guess that's, that's even worse when there's uncertainty. So you could go like a year of inflation and a year of deflation. I, I guess when there's that uncertainty, that's when people. Yeah, I think he's yeah. Well, I think he has longer swings longer. in his mind. I think it's like five and five. I think he's okay. got this boom, boom, this real long bobsled run. Um, and and uh, to me, and for many years now, I've been writing that that the time is the more important variable than 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 price. So I would, oh, I would so love it if the market just cut in half tomorrow because then I could go long, right? I Now, I was at a founder's dinner, a hedge fund founder's dinner. And then my write-up, I said, I don't remember founding a hedge fund, but there I was at a hedge fund founder's dinner with guys who were, whose personal wealth was considerably larger than mine. There's actually sports teams ownership at the table. And, uh, and uh, I lost my train of thought, but oh, a tech bull was ranting about the profit margins in tech and it, and a bear, a grizzled, famous veteran bear. Uh, oh, he's not a veteran bear, but I think he's been bearish for a while. Um, ripped into him and said, uh, "You don't. You've never ridden a position down ninety-five percent." He said, "You know, ninety-five percent losses." He says, "It's a ninety percent loss that then cuts in half." And and uh, and that's the problem. If you drop fifty percent, and then the market drops to eighty percent you've lost another 60%. So you, you still got killed. So, so, you know, grabbing the falling knife, the dead cat, whatever it is, you really do have to call it. You kind of got to call it right. Um, or, or by investments that have a cash flow. So that in the very worst case scenario, as Michael Barry would say, is your worst case scenario should be, if it goes way down, I just hold it. And if the thing has a cash flow, which isn't ARC, it isn't Facebook, it isn't Amazon, it isn't anything that we're, we're investing in these days as a society, um, it's things like Rio Tinto and, and Shell Oil or whatever oil company is now going by the name, ExxonMobil. Ones where you say, look, I will get a check in the mail every quarter. And then you just white knuckle it. You just take those checks and hope that inflation doesn't crush you too badly. Yes, yeah, so I guess once it, the market 
drops as you think it will or your base case has it then you're going to look to invest in those type of companies those cash flow positive ones well i actually have been nibbling at them i think in part to try to trick the market into thinking it's inflicting pain on me so i'm i'm really treating this as an anthropomorphic thing and so i'm trying to bait the market into make me suffer but but with you know it's like a blitz right i'm showing i'm showing blitz right um and i want the, the market to I, I want the market i want to let the I want to throw a screen pass, right? Um, and so, um, so I have invested. Starting in 2020, I started investing in energy, which is it was a great bottom call. If if that was the bottom, right? You never know where the bottom is. But um, I'm very reluctant to go in in any serious way um, because generally serious bear markets kill everything, right? It's a neutron bomb. And so if you are sitting on a stock with a PE of 10 and you think you're protected, um, that thing can go to five. And by the way, you know, the Fed model where you say that the equities, you know, track and in interest rates. Well, if that's true, why isn't the market cut in half? Right. The interest rates have, have doubled. And heaven only knows, I don't even pay attention to this stuff, but I, I presume corporate credit spreads are, have widened like hell, right? Is that right or not? Yeah, I think they have increased quite a lot. MYD. Right. So, so, so if if we're really supposed to track interest rates, which which I hate, I don't I don't like the Fed model, because uh, what you're doing is is you're justifying your valuations by comparing, um, by comparing your equity portfolio to the biggest bubble in history, the bond market. And so, if you really want to use that metric, be careful, right? Um, and it's like using NFTs as your as your benchmark or something. I don't know. Yeah, that's a challenge because a lot of people have you know, the 60, 40, or they might have less, but they have equities and bonds in their portfolio. And as you said there, <laughs> bonds probably haven't re reacted as most people would think during a bear market. A lot of them, the price hasn't gone up as, as much as they think. So well, that, that it, it's, that's yeah. because it's an inflation-induced bear market. Mm. And we've had 40 years of, of uh, inflation-free chatter. I think that inflation's been there off and on, but we've been sold on the idea that inflation's tame. And I've got some quotes from you know former Fed governors saying that because, because the market has no idea what inflation is, it, it won't be a problem. And I'm going, boy, that was the stupidest thing I've ever heard out of a Fed governor, which is a very high bar, I should have. Um, so, um, so I think the benchmark in theory should be not the interest rates, but inflation. So, so uh, if your investments aren't priced to return above inflation, then, then they're, not, they're not great investments potentially, right? You're gonna lose money. So I was a little above inflation, as I said, I still got whacked. And so what do you think the real inflation rate is? I'm asking you now, the real inflation rate, the one you feel. What do you think it is was this year what do you think 2022 inflation was yeah well i have uh talked to john williams from shadow stats so i know or that, but butowski yeah. from chapwood right yeah yeah but like i think he was mentioning 16 percent. but then from a lot of things i've seen lots of products that have been 25 plus 30 percent well like food products and, and other things and let's be honest the price of that isn't going to come down <laughs> No. So a, a single burst of 25% means you just got 25% poor. Right? If all of a sudden, all the, and so, and, and the other thing I marvel at is all the, remember, I don't know if you're, you hang on Twitter or just occasionally hit there, but um, I remember so many people saying, oh, you know, inflation will be great because it'll decrease the, the, the cost of my mortgage. And now I'm asking them rhetorically, how's that mortgage treating you? Has that gone down in price? Have you noticed that as an improvement? And by the way, is have the various home improvements you've had to do at 30 or 40% higher price, are they helping you? Is the taxation, which for me is going up 8% a year for the next two years, I'm told. So uh, uh, the price of food, I, I did a tweet. And my brother keeps track of everything. He's one of the guys who balances every checkbook down to the penny, every credit card down to the penny. He's an accountant by training. And he said his food bill was up 41%. I posted that. Jimmy Iorio chimed in and said, you know, in my restaurant, it's an Italian restaurant. So the Italian stallion owns an Italian restaurant. Um, he said his, his costs are up 
So the gross costs are up 25%. And then an accountant chimed in and said, I did the same math your brother did and came up with the same number. So I posted that and it's a sterile tweet. I mean, it's not like I came up with something really flashy. I just stated 41%. You know Twitter enough to know that 17,000 likes mean somehow that hit a nerve. And, uh, and, and people were feeling that pain and they're going, yes, that's correct. And so if you just took a, 20 to 40% hit on your spending power. I bet your salary's not keeping up. I, I, you know, I'd be shocked if people were getting 40% raises. Yeah, mine, was, mine was 3.5. <laughs> yeah, so. well, I'm, I'm sure the uh, faculty weren't too happy about that. <laughs> comparing to well, no, that, I, I hammered them though. Because so back in 08, 09, we had a year where they gave us no raises. And it was this austerity thing. No raises this year. You know, if they'd given us the raise and say, but we're not going to give it to you, you're still going to get paid the original salary, but your base salary. But if you're 30 years old and you're going to live till 70, you're going to work till 70, that missing three or 4% raise that you would have gotten is missing every year. So you have whopped 4% off of every salary for the rest of time. And that means you lost more than entire salary that year because they decided to not give you a raise. And then in 2022, our raise was three and a half percent when let's call inflation eight and a half, which is farcically low, but, but that's what the CPI shows. Um, we lost another 5%. And they're not going to come along and say, remember three years ago when we gave you a 5% under inflation, we're now going to give you 5% over inflation. No, that's never going to happen. So we've now lost, you know, somewhere, you know, eight to 10%. And if you're a young punk, I'm 67, that missing money will only be for a couple more years. But, uh, but if you're 25, 30 years old, that missing money, 10% year after year after year, you just got clobbered. And as I stated, there are 2.5 million total SAT points on our faculty. I did the math on that. And, uh, and three business schools and no one seemed to notice. Right? Yeah, that's crazy to think. Well, I know in the UK there's a winter of discontent, everyone's going on strike, nurses are tra- I can't get to And work. that's My embedded trends. inflation, right? That's embedded yeah. inflation. That that's the inflation expectation problem. And the question I like to ask rhetorically is if you were building a house two years from now, what what percent increase in the estimate would you put to cover inflation? Now I asked a contractor this question. Mm. He said 30. He said he put an extra 30% on the cost of building that house two years from now. Yeah. Well, I know um, my father's an architect and he's saying that developers can't actually get in, in Australia. Developers can't get a fixed price on how much the property will cost. And then the, the question is, <laughs> how are you going to buy a house not knowing? That's like a short position, right? Yeah. Well, 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 go, apparently oh, build me a house have, in two years based on an unknown price. People have paid for houses and the builders come back and ask for more mm-hmm. that are going to be built in two years because the prices have gone up. Well, I just bought a dog. No, I don't need a dog. But the person needed money, I think. And they're a legitimate breeder. And so I bought a dog with the idea that five years from now, that will be an inflation adjusted. I, I will tie inflation with that money when i finally need that dog a boston terrier i'm a boston terrier fanatic and uh my wife doesn't know i bought a dog oh you haven't got it yet (laughs) no i it turns out it's a it's basically an option the person said pay for the full dog you stay at the very front of the line which turns out to be a long line for the sprayer so you get first dibs on every litter and uh if you pay up front so i paid up front this is my son said it's a 2200 hour dog he said, you know, worst case scenario, dad, is she was 2,200. I'm thinking, oh, you're making me hurt a little bit there, but I get it, you know. <laughs> so, um, so inflation is the story and they can pretend like it's going back to 2%, but I think they're completely psychotic if they say that because there's so many people who are hurting now, they're going to be asking for more money. Is there any they other stories to. you think? 
Any other stories you mean besides inflation altogether? Yeah. You mean totally different? Well, I think the FTX collapse is a huge story that they're trying to stuff back down the rabbit hole, but I, I don't know if they'll get it down there or not, but it's not a crypto story. It's not about a collapsing crypto market. It's not about Bitcoin. It's not about crypto exchanges. It's about money laundering by the DNC through Ukraine. Huge, massive geopolitical corruption, my opinion. And when the White House was asked, you're going to give the money that, that, that SBF, Sam bankrupt fraud, um, gave to you, they pled the fifth. So here's the deal. You lost all your money on FT in FTX. They took your life savings, and the DNC now has it. How do you feel about that? That, sh that should bother you, right? I mean, you should really want to go lock and load, I would think, right? Yeah, you'd be Bernie, pretty mad. It was the Bernie Madoff? Uh, basically, they got almost all that money back. Same for I think politicians were forced to give money back from that scenario. Well, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's going to happen this time. And and uh, and it's one thing for Madoff to rob from you. It's another for the DNC to rob from you. Right? That that's a whole other level of psychopathy. So you shouldn't vote Democratic. Based on that, if you vote Democratic until you get evidence they've cleaned up their act, you're the problem. I don't know who you vote for. Vote for a libertarian. I don't care. But if you vote for Democratic, at, you vote Democratic after billions of personal money was laundered into the DNC at, at, the, at the owner's expense. You should want to kill somebody. I just, you should, you should be so mad. You should never vote Democratic again. Are the Republicans better? I don't know. But, you know, burn me once, shame on me, right? So I know you mentioned it in your article, but I guess for someone's hearing what you're saying now, they'll probably think this guy's ridiculous. What is he talking about? How are he is, they he laundering is billion, <laughs> billions? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if you want to give us a quick overview of how the Democrats could do that through FTX. And well, you know, so, did the Republicans so the, do that beforehand or no? I think the Republicans, I think the Republicans are being totally outplayed on the field. I think they could be just as much scoundrels. I think the Democrats, you know, when I was young, the Republicans were big business, Wall Street, you name it. And that's flipped now. So now the Republicans are sort of MAGA Joe six pack. Um, I think the DNC has control of Silicon Valley. I think the DNC has control of Wall Street. The bankers are all Democratic. And so they're, they're outplaying the Republicans. Um, the great circle is Biden gives our tax dollars to Ukraine. Ukraine using FTX actually funnels them back to various DNC PACs. There are these things like, you know, they sound okay. Who, who invents the name of a PAC that's, you know, uh, psychopathic thieves PAC? No, it's always something about saving the world. But they're all just DNC PACs. And then, uh, and then as I put, and I don't know for sure about this part, but I said in 10% for the big guy, right? And then, and then the next week we give another $10 billion to Ukraine. I don't know how much that money is making it to Ukraine. I think that a healthy chunk is going right to Raytheon and McDonnell Douglas and things like that. And I think another healthy amount was going literally through the bank of Ukraine through FTX back to the DNC. Um, but, but, and then the, the, you can tell how big, a how big a scam it is because the media is covering, is covering it up. So you will see an article of, you know, Carolyn Ellison, right? The, 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 the girlfriend, the, the, the middle school looking girlfriend of SPF. And they'll talk about how, how bad it is that she can't do philanthropy anymore. You know, she just stole billions of dollars and you're talking about how the loss is one of, to philanthropy. So, and you know, Andrew Ross Sorkin said, look, we can't have a system where you got to be able to take risks and risks mean you lose money. I go, Andrew Ross Sorkin, you're a shithead. You just, you just, you just place yourself right in the absolute bottom rung of the ladder by saying that. Because people didn't take risk to have it stolen by the DNC. They took risk to lose money with their crypto. And there's enough risk there to not layer on top of that some guy stealing it and giving it to, to super PACs 
And they gave tons to super PACs. And they've now gone to court to ask that. Um, so SBF has 250 bail, 250 million in bail. It's complicated because I've, I've read that, you know, you actually don't have to put up that much, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know. But um, they've now gone to court and asked that the people providing the bail money not be made public. So what are you hiding? This is Epstein level stuff. This is uh, this is all. This is the same corruption we see over and over and over. I, I, I think the world. I think people thought the modern world had gotten more honest. There's not a shred of evidence or any better than the ancient Roman Senate guys. There's just there's the, there, Why would we? Right? We're human. So I I think the guys at the top are lying, thieving, dastardly people who, if we could really apply the justice system to them, they would be taken to The Hague, tried and hung from the neck until dead for crimes against humanity. I'm not being metaphorical. I think there's many, many people for many, many reasons now that could be uh, sent through Nuremberg-like trials. But we're not going to, right? There's no evidence. Yeah, here's one for you, I like to ask. You know, you know how we're hearing about child trafficking as a problem, right? That's undeniable. People, and once in a while, there'll be a truck and there'll be like 40 little kids pulled out of the back of the truck. Oh, this is just horrible. Name when the, the last time you heard about some guy who bought one of these children got arrested. Who's been arrested for child trafficking? Who are the Johns? Where are they? Where are they? They're not going to trailer parks, right? These are, these are not kids who are being bought using, you know, food stamps. Where are the real bad people in this story? The last one I know of who got hit with some sort of pedophile-like charge was Denny Hastert, what was that 15 years ago? Which means he pissed someone off, right? Someone decided to take down Denny Hastert. Just like Dominique Strauss-Kahn, right? When he was gonna be head of the EU or something, I can't remember at this point. Um, but all of a sudden he gets a rape charge. Oh, Dominique's gone now. Yeah, it does seem that I don't know. It's like um, I don't know if you saw the Andrew Tate thing, which I find him. I have no idea what's person. going on there. I have yeah. no idea what's going on there. And it's just, I think it's when these really con controversial people, when it happens to them, you could say. It, it, I think what happens is they easily blame. They just blame. Oh, you know, he was a bad person. They've be, been building this narrative, but it's like, is there actually something else behind it? It's hard to know. Well, so for example, I understand why people hate Trump. I, no difficulty whatsoever. You know, I voted for him twice. But the first time when I went to pull the lever, I was cutting a cold sweat, right? This was not a comfortable thing to do, but my hatred for Hillary was just so extraordinary. And my, I, was, my, I was completely convinced that she's a psychopathic thief, liar, you name it, and that the Clinton Foundation is a crime syndicate. And so I said, there's no way I can vote for Hillary. Um, I don't think Trump, earned any of that disdain. I think he's idiosyncratic as hell. He's a narcissist. There's lots of reasons why you can still not like him at all and not vote for him at all. But um, you ought to be able to, at the same time, hold in your head the opposing idea that he was treated brutally by the deep state. You know, the whole steel dossier and stuff like that. And, and, and if you can't hold those two ideas together, which is something that um, Aristotle first mentioned that you should be able to do. He also said something about you should be able to hold an idea, you should be able to entertain an idea without endorsing it. That was a, an Aristot Aristotelian thing. Um, then you're, you're just, uh, you're, uh, your mind is too rigid. You're not capable of, of keeping opposing ideas in your head simultaneously. Yeah, that's a very good point. So you mentioned Ukraine. And one thing I found interesting with that as well is you mentioned, you know, Azov Battalion and other aspects of corruption in Ukraine. And you said right. if you uh, stop the, it, on Google search, you can sort of put the, the range of the dates. So if you put it before the invasion, then you get all those things about Azov Battalion being Nazis and how they're horrible from 2015, 2016, as well as, you know, Ukraine corruption. But yeah, like uh, like it. Mexican drug lords, right? Yeah. Mexican drug lord level savagery, right? Yeah. By the way, you don't even need the date range. They have not been able to clean up the Azov Battalion's Google search or Twitter. So go on Twitter and search Azov Battalion. You will find nothing but brutality, Nazis, 
you know, turtles all the way down, right? And, uh, and, and yet, these are the freedom fighters in Ukraine. These are the guys who are now called Ukrainian nationalists. So the CIA said, okay, these brutal Nazis are the guys that we can tap to fight Putin. Let's tap them. And if you read about things they've done, you go, oh, we should have given Putin weapons, not the Azov Battalion. And so Putin appears to me, so I take the seemingly unpopular stance, although I've gotten very little hate mail, I've gotten a lot of prominent guys saying, um, you're dead right. Um, I put the Ukraine war pretty much entirely on NATO's shoulders. I think NATO had the ability on numerous occasions to prevent this war from occurring. And they didn't want to do that. They wanted, they were willing to throw every last Ukrainian under the bus, kill every last Ukrainian to give Putin guff. That's psychopathy. That's back to the, you know, and, you know, and, and I get into it with the sanctimony industrial complex. I thought I coined that phrase and then someone was giving me credit for it. And I said, I should look that up. It turns out, it might be an Eric Weinstein phrase. I don't know, but he predated me. Um, if you're waving your yellow blue flag and you don't know anything about the Azov battalion, you got duped. You've been duped at a profound level. And what you don't know is that there's been a civil war raging in Ukraine for, for a decade now. And that ethnic Russians in Ukraine have been getting slaughtered for a decade now. And that it's the Azov Battalion. And Zelensky has done unbelievably bad things, including banning all his political opponents, arresting them, putting out warrants for them across the world, banning the Catholic Church from Ukraine. So if you think supporting Zelensky is supporting democracy, you've been duped. There's nothing, I found nothing to support that case. Zelensky is every bit as bad as anybody else in that region of the world, which is, by the way, a fairly rough area. And so, uh, so you can sit there and get all, feel really good about, about supporting Ukraine, but you're an idiot, in my opinion. If, if, and if, if by me saying this to you, you don't go dig around, then you deserve to be called an idiot. If you go dig around, then I, I, I recant on calling you an idiot and say, you were just not keeping up. But if you say, oh no, the column's full of shit, then you're an idiot. And, and I want nothing to do with you because you have no curiosity. Yeah, I am. Um, I get kind of angry actually. I get kind of <laughs> fired up. Yeah, it's it's good. I don't know. I'm, uh, I don't care enough to get fired up about, but it is something that's very important. I think, um, one thing you mentioned there as well about, I guess, Ukrainians killing Russians. And, you know, I'm quite neutral in terms of the war and I guess who caused it and, you know, it, Russia shouldn't invade it. But obviously you could say, as you said, NATO did. There wasn't any compromise there. They could have just said they weren't going to expand into Ukraine, probably would have stopped the whole thing. Um, someone I talked to who was a very strong Democrat, academic, you probably the people you talk to every single day was saying that he knew someone from, ukraine from the donbass and they had seen the, that person seen a, a russian get shot by a ukrainian just a russian citizen so i found that was quite shocking to hear well that. it's much worse than that i mean ethnic right they're called ethnic russians these yeah. are guys in the eastern part of ukraine who really don't think of themselves even as ukrainian they kind of got caught there so there's a big chunk of ukraine that i think would readily reassimilate into to russia but see nato doesn't want that to occur. NATO being the United States. I don't think I don't think the US has huge backing from Europe. I think they're kind of playing along. Um, but I, I think at the beginning of the war, before the war started, I think most of our NATO allies were trying to find a way to stop this thing and the US just wouldn't do it. We, we literally, by arming the Ukrainians, were sending them to their death. So the question I'd like to ask, and those who are listening, Answer it honestly. If we stop sending weapons to Ukraine today, how long would it be before that war ended? I'm guessing tomorrow, <laughs> right? I'm guessing if we say you're on your own, Zelensky's going to be rushing off to Moscow as fast as possible, saying, never mind all those things I said. I wasn't serious. 
And then you say, ah, oh, the Russians are going to do X, Y, and Z. And there's no evidence of that. There's no evidence Russia was targeting civilians. That was all propaganda. There's plenty of evidence. The estimated ethnic Russian kill count over the last 10 years is about 15,000. And the actual proximate trigger for the war, although it's often said to be, you know, us pushing Ukraine into NATO, which there's really fundamental problems where the Russians can't tolerate that. Be the equivalent of, 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 of Russia pushing, pushing Mexico into the Warsaw nations. Right. We'd go. How, how how long would it take if, if Russia started putting serious weapons along the border of, of Mexico? How long would it be before we turn Mexico into a sheet of glass? And the answer is 20 seconds. Right. Wouldn't take long, be just long enough to get the emails flying. And OK, let's do it. And so so to say that Russia has no right to be concerned about what's going on on their southern border. It's nuts. And so I've gotten surprisingly little hate mail on this because I think when people hear, maybe when people hear it, they, they just think I'm nuts. Maybe they go, oh, this is troubling. Maybe, maybe it's registering, I don't know. I, got a, I had an Eastern European send me stuff and correct things. I can't say he was wrong, but I wrote 45 pages. So of course, and I, I must have said five times, there's no way I got this right. I'm just trying to figure it out. And there's no way I have found the layer of the onion that represents truth. This is Dave's narrative, right? And he, he found some stuff, but some of the stuff I don't think he was right about too. You know, he talked about Putin killing his own citizens. Well, you know, the war in Chechnya, I, I've read a lot about that since writing it. And it turns out that it was not Putin's greatest moment by any stretch of the imagination, but it's also what shaped his approach to Ukraine. Chechnya taught him avoid casualties. So I, I don't think anyone's made the case that, that Putin was trying to kill Ukrainians. I think he wanted literally a bloodless war. But then it got real. And then when the U.S. blew up the pipeline. Tell me that's not seriously awful foreign policy. The Germans should be bombing us. They should just be sending troops to our shores and say, we've had it. We're going back to war with you guys. The Germans should be beyond mad at that because they are not getting energy they desperately needed. And that's why we bombed the pipeline. And then you go on, you watch the news and say, oh, the Russians bombed their own pipeline. And as Caitlin Johnstone, I think, said, well, we should just wait and let Russia destroy its entire country and then we win. Right. So so Putin didn't want to have to rebuild new Ukraine. He didn't want to have to rebuild their infrastructure. And this was predicted by several pundits who said, look, Putin's going to not fight an urban war. He's going to suck the Ukrainian army into defending the big cities. He's going to do an end run. And then what he's going to do is he is going, I'm going to use harsh words here. He's going to exterminate the Azov Battalion in a very unfun way. So the Azov guys were going to be rubbed out. This was going to be a mob St. Valentine's Day massacre moment for the Azov guys. Because he wanted, Putin wanted Ukraine to have no Azov battalion, no military, no nothing. And if we took their weapons, the NATO would give it back. So Putin's goal, I do believe, was an, a cleansing of the Azov guys. But they're very bad people. They really are not good. And they're not neo-Nazis. They've been Nazis since World War II. There's a long history of the Azov Battalion that goes back all the way to World War II when Stepan Bandera was fighting with the Germans to slaughter Russians in Ukraine. And then you find out the all roads you lead to Ukraine, you find out that Christia Freeland, second in command of Canada and arguably the one who's running it, is a Ukrainian Nazi. And then you find out there's pictures of Ukrainian Nazis at January 6th. You go, what is going on here? This is crazy time now. And then you find out that indeed the Russians knew this. And I think this was actually known, but we have 46 bioweapons labs in Ukraine. We do. The Pentagon just put it on their website that we do. So what are we doing with 46 bioweapons labs in Ukraine? Probably the good stuff, like, I don't know, genetically modified coronavirus. That would be a good example of what they might find there, right? 
46 bioweapons labs when I don't think we're supposed to have bioweapons labs, right? Now, maybe the world is that rough a place and they're really trying to save my bacon. And as they said in, you know, that Tom Cruise movie, you know, you can't handle the truth. Maybe I just can't handle the truth. 46 bio, read Demon in the Freezer. We were sweating about all those Russian bioweapons labs. And they were rickety and stuff. Well, we put 30, 46 of our own in Ukraine. The Clinton Foundation, number one donor, Ukraine. We know that the Biden's number one donor, Burisma, right? I, it just FTX donating. That the guy who um, the guy who supported Zelensky the most. There's an oligarch who bought Zelensky. Real estate, all sorts of stuff. He was the owner of. He was the CEO of Burisma. I mean, the, the world just connects in this strangely bizarre way. And. I feel like Whitney Webb at some level, although she's far superior at doing this stuff, but Whitney's a puzzle piece connector. You should interview her if you haven't. Yeah, I'll definitely have to uh, re reach out to her. So yeah. uh, this sounds really interesting. So Dave, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. We've covered so many different topics. Uh, I guess what is one message you'd like people to take away from our conversation or maybe uh, for the year to be, yeah, some piece of advice for the year? Um. This is actually a piece of advice that really goes back to last year. I didn't write about it this year, but I think that we are looking, we're at risk of a rising authoritarianism. And, and, and I would argue that the, 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 the moment that the internet went live, um, it was a battle for control of the digital world. And I, I fear we're losing it. And I, I used to call it, the internet was democracy's greatest hope and worst enemy. And I fear that we're losing it. So, um, so don't give up a civil liberty without a fight. Don't give up any civil liberty without a fight. You do not want COVID vaccine monitoring mechanisms. They're already monitoring your phone. So we've lost, right? I, my wife broke her neck. Next thing I know, I'm getting, I'm getting, advertisements for neck braces, right? They, they know what, what we're up to. Um, but don't give up the civil liberties, which means don't, don't let the authorities lock you down for your own sake. And you know, well, it was for the sake of the children. Well, they weren't gonna die. That was baloney. Pregnant women, oh, they weren't gonna die. Um, uh, COVID, the COVID story, I think, has destroyed many people's confidence, which is a plus for me because their confidence was misplaced. So now we have a bunch of people finally saying, Jesus, the FDA and the CDC are corrupt. What next? And the answer is everything, everything. So we need to somehow wake up and, and battle to get our liberties back. That's my advice. Fight every fight. Yeah, and I think you you know you realize that in uh, your personal life as well when you keep giving away these small small things, people just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Anyway. Yeah, it's like gun control. It's like gun control, right? If they get rid of machine guns, are they going to say, "Okay, we're good now"? No. So you fight the machine gun fight. Yep, definitely. Um, awesome. So Dave, thank you so much for your time. So uh, you know, I'll, I'll put the link in the description below for your review, and I'll put your Twitter down there as well. Are those the best places to see your stuff? Uh -huh. yeah awesome so thanks again for your time thank you so much for listening and if you enjoyed the episode please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released i hope you're leaving with some great value about investing trading and finance see you on the next show